Hey, we exist to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus and His way. And we're so glad to have you with us this morning. My name is Alex. I'm the pastor of Cascades. And we're going to spend some time singing and opening up our Bibles, have some community announcements, and, and, and a time of communion. And I'm just going to open up our time in prayer, and our worship leader, Jonas, is going to lead us. God, you're welcome here. And we want to see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Wherever anyone is at in this moment, Lord, would you just bless them with your presence and your grace. We say you are welcome here, God. In your name, amen. Hey, church, we're going to enter a time of worship now. Uh, before we start singing, I just want to read a quick psalm. And so it's Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. And that's just so comforting, knowing that we uh, serve a God who, uh, whose love endures forever and that we are his people. So let's sing together. Every blessing to my heart to sing that grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. And teach me so melodious sonnet. Sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain. Fixed upon it, mountain I redeeming love. And I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. And now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home. Now your grace is always with me and I'll never be alone. Come thou found, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. Hear your bride, to you we sing, come thou found of our blessing. So oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. And prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take it, seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Come thou found, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. He your bride, to you we sing, come thou found of our blessing. Come thou found, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. He your bride, to you we sing, come thou found of our blessing.
before the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. But know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. Satan tempts me to despair And tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there Who made an end of all my sin Because a sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me behold him there the risen lamb my perfect spotless Righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace, one in himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high. Christ my Savior and my God, because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free, for God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. This is my prayer in my hunger and need. My God is the God who provides. This is my prayer in the fire, in weakness or trial or pain. There is a faith proved of more worth than gold. So refine me, Lord, through the flame. I will bring praise. I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice. I will declare. God is my victory, and He is here. All of my life 
in every season you are still God I have a reason to sing I have a reason to worship all of my life in every season you are still God I have a reason to sing I have a reason to worship So I will bring praise I will bring praise No weapon formed against me shall remain I will rejoice I will declare God is my victory And He is here And I will bring praise I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain, and I will rejoice, and I will declare, God is my victory, and He is here. This is my prayer in the harvest. It's flow. I know I feel to be emptied again. The seed I've received, I will sow. Hey Church, I have a few announcements for you. Five things. First off, if you miss any announcements or anything like that, you can subscribe to our weekly email, our weekly newsletter. Just head on over to our homepage at cascadeschurch.ca. Go to the homepage, scroll to the bottom, hit subscribe, and you could stay up to stay up to date with anything that's going on in the week. Second, we have our prayer walk this Wednesday at 12 p.m. meeting at the church, and uh, this is a time just to spend some time in prayer uh, for our city, for our neighborhood, and just anticipate God to do great things and. And yeah, I hope you could uh, join us with that. Third, uh, just to follow up from last week's message, we have some resources out for you on racial justice. And this is just uh, for you to take some next steps uh, wherever you are at on this journey. And you can find those resources at cascadeschurch.ca slash racial justice. Fourth, we have a parking lot pastoral visits. And if you're interested in that, uh, just give Alex, uh, Pastor Alex an email or a call. We'd love to hear from you. And lastly, offering. Offering is a part of our worship here at Cascades Church. Um, we say, hey God, everything that we have is yours, even our money, and, and uh, we just want to give that. So we're going to take uh, the next few minutes uh, just to give online, and then we're going to hear from Pastor Alex in the message. So uh, yeah, we'll take a few minutes now.
Hey, would you turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 14. We're in this series right now called Thriving in Exile. And we really kind of kicked this off because we saw that COVID really threw everything for a loop. The routines, the rhythms, the things that uh, just kind of gave us a sense of of balance or, or feeling like life was normal have been thrown out the window. And in that time, it's been really easy for us to get discouraged, frustrated, angry. And so one of the things we thought through was, how do we make the best of this time? So that when we are able to gather once again, we come back stronger. That's been one of the questions. How can we turn this season of turmoil and tribulation into one where we actually lean deeper into God and the ways, His ways and what He's doing in our world? And so we have looked at different passages and different moments throughout Scripture uh, that really speak to this idea of exile, where we have to depend and call on Him. And today we're in the book of Daniel. Now Daniel, the book of Daniel, describes the experience of God's people in exile in Babylon. And in 589 BC, the Babylonian Empire laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. And in 587, 86, they defeated Jerusalem. They sieged, they sacked the city, I should say, they destroyed the temple, and they forcibly took the strongest, smartest, best Jews back to Babylon to subject them to this cultural conquest, which was in many ways uh, just as devastating as the military defeat that they experienced. And so Daniel, this book, it really kind of captures and gives this powerful account of how the Babylonians tried to eradicate Israel's way of life, while at the same time showing us a few people who successfully resisted and continue to worship God in this time. And so that's what we're looking at. We're looking at one of these episodes from Daniel chapter 3, and we're going to be in verse 14. Then Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I have made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed, and he ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men wearing robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. And he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, royal advisors crowded around them and they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed, their robes were not scorched, there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god.
God, we give you praise and thank you for what you've done in the past, what you did in this moment with these three guys, what you've done through your son, Jesus, and what you're doing today. And we ask that today you would speak to us through your word, that you would challenge us, encourage us, give us ears to hear what you have for us. We pray all these things today in your name. Amen. The big idea this morning is that God is sovereign and able to deliver his people from the fires of exile. Nebuchadnezzar is angry. He's furious when he hears that these three have, are refusing to worship this statue, this image of a God that he has made. He seems to have forgotten that just a little while earlier, for us at least, when we read Daniel chapter 2, verse 47, he says to Daniel, because he's revealed this dream and the interpretation of it to him, he says, hey, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. He says that, and now we see in this chapter that he wants everyone to worship this other image. What's going on there? Well, the reason for this, most scholars seem to believe that there's like a gap, a, a, a several year separation between Daniel 2 and Daniel 3. And uh, I, I've read even like nine years, right? So it seems like he might just have short-term memory loss. It's probably not that, you know, there's several years removed. And so there's that. The other thing to know though, is that the Babylonians were polytheistic. So they believed in many gods. They didn't just believe in one. And they tended to believe that they weren't too interested in the affairs of humanity. But Nebuchadnezzar, he had some motivations for building this statue, this image of a god. And part of it was that his kingdom had expanded over the years. He continued to conquest and bring in other nations with other languages and different ways of viewing the world and all of that. And he had actually had to re repel a rebellion that had started up in his empire during this time. And one of the things he wanted to do was have everyone be united. And so he brings all these different people from different nations and different languages to come and worship this one image. And this image, the statue was massive. It was 90 feet tall. Picture a nine-story building, and it's nine feet wide. Most uh, scholars suggest that it was probably something like just like a, a t very tall statue, and it had a bust at the top of it that actually looked like Nebuchadnezzar. And so part of what he was doing here was associating his own power and himself with divinity. And he wanted to extend his kingdom. And if you remember in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel tells him, hey, the only reason you're a king is because God has placed you in this position as king. And he gave him, he had this, he described how in his dream he saw this statue where just the head was gold and then there was silver and bronze and all that. And in this statue that Nebuchadnezzar makes, it's a fully gold statue. There's something going on here where Nebuchadnezzar is trying to force and ensure that his kingdom lasts beyond just him. And it's not just a head of gold, it's an entire statue. He wants to assert his dominance, his reign over here. And he wants to make sure that every single kingdom and all the ones he subjected worships this statue. He wants some uniformity. Everyone does. As soon as the music plays, everyone starts to worship, except for these three guys, Daniel's friends, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They understood they couldn't meet these demands that Nebuchadnezzar was making. They lived as subjects of an empire. They were a min minority within this empire, but they couldn't follow the commands of their ruler. Not in this case. This isn't something they could go and do. Some of the others, other subjects noticed that these Jews refused to do it. And so they go and, you know, snitch on them. And they go tell the king, and the king is furious. But rather than just throw them into the furnace right away, which was the consequence he had made, he said, I want to hear it for myself. So he brings them before them, and that's what we saw in our passage that I just read, is them speaking to the king. And I want to just kind of highlight some of the things that we see that they do there, right? They, they show their confidence in God, their commitment to serving him, and they speak to God's ability to delivering them. And you can see this uh, from verses 16 through 18. So I just want to kind of really narrow in on that. And then we'll just kind of talk about some implications. In verse 16, they say, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. They speak here with this understated confidence. And they're speaking to the mightiest 
uh, human picture of power in this moment. And they're saying, look, we don't got to defend ourselves before you. They know that they have been faithful, good servants to this king, Nebuchadnezzar. They, you know, their trust in God hasn't interfered and stopped them from being able to do that up until this very moment. And we see here, they're not begging. They're not groveling. They're not trying to explain themselves or even explain their God. They know their record as administrators at this time, and it speaks for itself. And they knew their God, and they knew they didn't have to defend him. They didn't have to defend their actions because they know that they're ultimately not accountable to King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of the day, when they die, they knew that. It wasn't going to be him that they stood before. If you carry on into verse 17, they say, If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God, and I just want to focus on that God. Who is this God they're talking about? Well, they're talking about God as in Yahweh, the true source of power, the God of Israel, the God of all history, the God of the Exodus, of Revelation up on Mount Sinai, the God who led them into the Promised Land, the God who had led David and the other kings at the time. These were Jewish believers who had been educated in the literature, the philosophy, the art, the science of the Babylonian Empire, but they hadn't lost their childhood faith. They had learned about Yahweh and been taught up and raised in Him back in Jerusalem. And now they were exiles in this empire, and here they are saying, listen, the God we serve. They focus on Him because that's the one they know, and they put their trust on Him. Here's why this matters. In exile, the Israelites tended to think of the Babylonian gods as having defeated Yahweh. The empire, the Babylonian empire, came to Jerusalem and laid siege, and Jerusalem was defeated, and they were taken as exiles to Babylon. Where was God? Where was Yahweh? How had he protected them? How had, had, had he helped them, right? There, there was this temptation here to see Yahweh as a weak God as too small, and they were actually tempted to worship Babylon's gods, all these other gods. The irony here, of course, is that the reason God actually allowed Israel to be taken into exile is that they had chosen to worship other gods and broken covenant with God in Jerusalem, in the land he had given them, and to be in this relationship, to be his special people. They had broken that covenant over and over and over again, and the prophets had warned them, and they refused to repent. And so now they're in exile, and some of them are actually, in their, in their despair, are being tempted to worship other gods, thinking that Yahweh is just, he's too small. Essentially, Yahweh had not delivered them from the Babylonians, is their belief. He hadn't protected their families. He hadn't protected their city, their kingdom. No, the Babylonians, they experienced victory. They destroyed their city and their temple. See, the, te the temptation in exile is to see weakness and suffering and experience it and to see and believe that God is small and weak, that the Babylonian gods are mightier and worthier of worship. And we do the same thing, even though we don't live in a polytheistic culture. We worship other things, you know, we find other things. Human beings were made to worship. So even if we don't choose to worship God, Yahweh, if we don't choose to worship Jesus, we're going to worship something else. And we worship what we ascribe worth to. What you ascribe the greatest worth or value is what you worship. This is why Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 says, Wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be. Because what you treasure, what you long for most in life, is what you will actually worship. We don't worship Babylonian gods, but we treasure and will long for stuff like a new home or a TV. It might be that actually it's like a god of consumerism or our image, or our appearance, or comfort, or just this idea of having a relationship and finally being able to settle down. All of these things can be good things, except consumerism. But the other ones, right, they can be good things, but that we make out as an idol as we, become to, as we start to treasure them more and more and more, more than God. Seeing them as the one and true thing that can truly satisfy us when it's only God that gives us that. 
And the reason we do this is just like the, the, the people of God in exile is because we don't believe that God is actually good enough, that he is good and mighty to save, that he is faithful, that he is present. And so we get tempted in that moment to look to something else that can help us. Here's the thing, though. That leaves us with no hopeful, no hope for the future. We'll live in the present, in the here and now. See, at the end of the day, when we have a very low view of God, we won't worship or serve him in our trials. We'll look elsewhere. We'll tend to look at him as maybe more of a genie than Lord of Lords and King of Kings. In this moment, this trio of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they say, the God whom we serve. See, they knew who God is. They had a high view of him, and they served him. And they understood that there was no one else that was worthy to be worshipped. When God brings Moses up on Mount Sinai and gives him the Ten Commandments, he's, he has them know one of the very first commands he says is you won't have you shall have no other gods before me you won't bow down and serve them and here in this moment they're in exile because israel had actually done that very thing and now they have this opportunity to actually say no even here in exile we will not do this the god whom we serve is the only one we will serve he's the only one we will worship and again they're saying this right in the face of the ultimate picture of power at the time, the king. He's the one that calls the shots. He sees like, no, you guys serve me. And they're like, no, 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 we serve him. They're basically saying, yeah, you know what? We know you, we are your servants, but in serving you, we are actually serving God, the one who put you in this position of power. It's strikingly similar to what Jesus says in, Ma in John, chapter 19 when he's speaking to Pilate Pilate is confronting him because he's being quiet as he tries to question him and he says don't you know that I have the power to release you and to crucify you and Jesus turns to him and says you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above these guys what they're saying have these striking similars to similarities to that the God we serve they go on to say is able to deliver us from it. He's able to deliver us from the fiery trial, this furnace, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand, they say. See, of course God can deliver us, they say. He's able to do it. He created everything. He, he made the sea and rescued the sea, Israel from the sea. Daniel, too, has reminded us that God is able. He's able to reveal these mysteries, that he is the one who put King Nebuchadnezzar in this position of power. He's the one that's truly in charge. And he's going to bring that kingdom, his kingdom, which will humble all other human kingdoms. He's the one with real power and with real sovereignty over the affairs of the seen and unseen realm, over the affairs of heaven and earth. And no one is trying to convince the king here. They're not pleading or begging. There's just this quiet confidence in the power of God to save them. It's this powerful picture of their faithfulness and confidence in the face of a threat to their life. They say, no, we have like planted our flag here. If there's a hill we're going to die on, it's here. We're not going to serve any other gods. It doesn't matter that we are the minority. It doesn't matter that we are weaker. It doesn't matter that you have power over us to decide whether we're going to live or not. We're going to choose to worship and serve Him alone. But then something really interesting happens, because in verse 18, it almost appears as if they walk back what they've just said. They say, even if He does not, we want you to know, Your Majesty, that we won't serve you or gods or worship the image you've set up. And again, it seems kind of weird, right? Even if He doesn't? Are they doubting God here? Are they unsure? Well, some have read it like that, and that's a possible reading. Uh, my reading would be that that's not what's actually going on here, that they're not preparing for the worst case scenario. I think what they're doing is something a little bit different. They're affirming their faith in him, 
but they leave God his freedom to do as he pleases. They affirm God's power, but they also affirm his sovereignty to choose as he will. They believe in God's ultimate wisdom, which sees all things way better than they can. And so they entrust themselves to whatever he can. He can deliver them, but he is sovereign to choose this. And if you, you know what, if you choose to just focus and create a theology off of verse 17 of God's ability and that he will deliver them, then it can easily lead you down a place where you believe in kind of a name it and claim it type of theology. A name it, I claim it, I'm going to receive it. But verse 18 reminds us of that. And I think when you look at the, the whole uh, breadth of the Bible of Scripture, you can actually see this. That there are times where we see that he does deliver, and there's other moments where it seems like he doesn't. In our passage today, it's beautiful because we see that he does, right? Christopher Wright, he says this, they declare total faith in God's ability along with a total acceptance of God's freedom. God is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our worship in the good and in the bad, in the light and in the dark. He's the only true God. There are no others. So they've chosen to worship him. They understand they can't control him, that we can't control God. We don't have a say over every decision that he makes. And we know this, when you look at scripture, you'll see it all over. One, let, me give me, let me give you a couple uh, passages you can check out today, this week even. Acts chapter two, you see two characters, Peter and James. Both of them get imprisoned under the same ruler, King Agrippa. One of them dies, the other is freed and rescued because God sends an angel. James, what happens to him? He's killed. Peter gets to go free. Both are key leaders in the early movement of, of, of Jesus' followers, the church, right? They're both key leaders in that movement. God uses them. God loves them. They both trust and want to follow him. And, and then we have the church. It doesn't tell us they pray for James, but we've got to assume they would have been praying for James just as they prayed for Peter. But James dies, Peter's done. And we're not told why, but both happen. Hebrews chapter 11 highlights this very similar thing. We often think of Hebrews chapter 11 as like this hall of faith. And it describes those who, in verse, 30, uh, verse 33, those who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the uh, fury of flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead and raised to life again. But then this is followed by another list of people who also had faith in God and trusted him and yet were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. Both groups, Hebrews 11 verse 39 says, were commended for their faith. Both groups trusted that God was able to deliver, that he was faithful, and yet we see that God, for some reason, delivered some and didn't deliver others. And yet both groups are included in that great crowd of witnesses in Hebrews chapter 12. See, we come to worship God because of who he is and what he does for us. It's not simply what he does for us. He's not just a genie. We worship him because he's actually worthy of it. He's the only God, the only one that is worthy of our praise. He's the only one that can handle all of our hopes and dreams. We know that in Jesus, he has come to actually restore his creation, to restore humanity, to deal with all of our brokenness and sin. He's the reason we actually have a hope in this world. And he's Lord of all. See, our worship is directly connected to what we believe about God. 
And so if we have a very low view of him, we won't be in any way desiring or wanting to worship him. If we think, if we think he is truly God, mighty and strong, able to save, one who is quick to forgive, one who hears the cries of his people, who cares about justice and righteousness, who cares about sin in our world, enough to actually come in and do it and deal with it and enter into our world. This is who we worship, right? And so there, there, it's important for us to actually understand that, what we believe about God. So here, here's a few things of what this means. Christopher Wright, uh, I'm just going to channel him for a bit. He, he offers a, a few different prayers of what this could look like in our life. And just allow me to read a paraphrase of a few of them. Jesus, I believe you can protect my family and I from danger, from sickness and death, and I ask that you would. But even if not, I won't serve gods of bitterness and resentment. I will serve you. Jesus, I believe you are able to help me find a life partner to enjoy your normal gifts of marriage and family. I ask you would provide this. But even if you don't, I won't bow down and serve the worthless gods of self-pity. Jesus, I believe you are able to protect and preserve my reputation, my job, if I have to take a stand for what is right and just, as you instruct me. And I ask you would. But even if you don't, and I lose all of that, I won't bow down and serve the God of fear or compromise and take the way of the world. Why not? Why not? Because he's worthy of our worship. And you know what? Even Jesus shows us that's not his way. And our church exists to embrace Jesus, to be devoted to Jesus and his way. It's not the way of Jesus to choose fear, to serve these other gods. That's not the way of the one we worship. Well, what's the way of God? Well, he's so committed to being with his people. He doesn't just leave his people to, or humanity even to their own devices. He doesn't ignore them. He's deeply interested and invested in what he has created. This world, the universe, humanity. He made it all. And we were made to worship him and know him, to live in relationship with him. Life is best like served and operated when we actually trust him. And the three friends here of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they did that. And what happened? Well, actually, they're thrown into the fiery furnace. They are actually thrown right into it. If it was up to King Nebuchadnezzar, they, would, they should have died. But in the fire, Nebuchadnezzar gives us his, his own way of seeing it in that moment, right? He sees four people with the appearance, one of them having the appearance of like a son of God. A divine being is in there. Later on, he says God had sent an angel. He knows it's not human. I think this is pre-incarnate Jesus. You can disagree. That's just my, my take. I know uh, some early church uh, leaders uh, did see this as Jesus, pre-incarnate there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the picture here ultimately is that God is with his people, that he is with us in the fire, that he doesn't abandon us in our suffering, that he doesn't abandon us even in exile. He doesn't leave Israel. He's with them. He's with those people who want to follow him, who know him. He's calling to those who aren't. Literally in the moment where they have to trust God the most, God is right there. The veil is removed for you and I, the reader of this story, and it was removed for King Nebuchadnezzar. This veil is removed, and in this moment, they see how present God is. And though they had initially been bound physically, the entire time they were not bound spiritually. They were able to worship, and they were able to choose to worship Him. And it's this moment where King Nebuchadnezzar sees that the veil is removed, and he actually praises and worships Yahweh. It should be no surprise to us that God actually wants to be with us. It was the prophet Isaiah who spoke 
and said, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And if you fast forward 500 years after this event, about 500 years, and you read in Matthew chapter uh, 1, verse 23, an angel appears to Joseph and tells him to take Mary, who has conceived through the Holy Spirit and will have a son. And he tells him to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then Matthew adds this little caveat. This was to fulfill what the prophet had written, that, that a virgin would conceive and give birth to a son, and they would call him Emmanuel, meaning God with us. This has been God's heartbeat. Jesus is literally God with us. God with skin on, walking among us, feeling joy, feeling pain, having developing friendships, learning all the things that humanity experiences, you and I experience, Jesus did too. We don't worship a God who is far and distant and uninterested in human affairs. He actually comes to be with us, not just to write in the fire, but to experience all of life in the person of Jesus. And Jesus is one who actually prays and asks God to be delivered from the cross. He says, Father, all things are possible with you. Take this cup, because he knew the cross was going to be terrible. And then he says, nevertheless, I want your will, not my will. And what happens? What happens? He goes to the cross. He's crucified. He spat on. He goes through an unjust trial. He's condemned to death. On the cross, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the cross, Jesus suffers the worst death, the loneliest death. And he trusted the Father. It cost him his life. And he trusted the Father, and it cost him his life. On the cross, he experienced the worst trial. But because of him, for those of us who put our trust in him, in our own fiery trials, in our suffering, he is really with us. He knows it. He empathizes with us. On the cross, he took on our sin, our shame, the death we deserved. You see, he took our place. He took on what we should have had so that when we go through our fiery trials, we don't have to be alone. We can have him. He's given us the Holy Spirit now who dwells in us. And together with the Spirit, Jesus is interceding to the Father. There's this beautiful picture of the Trinity. And they're interceding on behalf of his, of his people whom he loves and died for. He's with us, and we need to know that. Because you and I are going to be tempted, be tempted to despair, to give up, to walk away, to quit and surrender. And what we need to understand is that our steps and our decisions to trust God and to depend on Him are acts of defiance against the flesh, against these other idols, and are an act of worship to God. And when we take that very initial step, to put our trust in Jesus as Lord and forgiver, to say, you're the one in charge, you're the one I'm going to follow, that's when he delivers us. When we make that initial decision, he delivers us from our sin. He delivers us from the consequences of sin, which is death. He delivers us, us from the separation from God and actually brings us into this relationship with God. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He makes us righteous. He puts his Spirit in us makes us alive with Him. There's this power when we choose to reject the ways of this world and embrace the way of Jesus and choose to worship God, even in the darkness, even in our pain and suffering. See, Jesus trusted His Father, even to the point of death, and we know that because of the, de the resurrection, that God is indeed trustworthy and vindicates His people. And so many people we know of and have even heard stories of have died unjust death. But for those who put their trust in Jesus, we know that God will actually vindicate them. 
God is a just God and he cares about it. God in heaven, I pray that you would move and speak to us this week, lead us so that we would be able to worship you wholeheartedly, to trust you wholeheartedly through the fires, through the trials, through our suffering. And God, would you show us just how near you are, just as you are and were with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just as you have been with your people throughout generations. We want you today. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Hey church, thanks so much for joining us. It's been so good uh, being able to worship with you. Uh, May the Lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you. We'll see you next week.